this video we'll be looking at genetic lineages also known as pedigrees you need to know the following with regards to this topic you need to know what a genetic lineage or a pedigree is what it does and then you also need to be able to interpret these diagrams so a genetic lineage or pedigree traces the inheritance of characteristics over many generations or alternatively it is a register recording a line of ancestors but when you write down the definition I would like you to write down that one over there so I'm sure you guys have watched movies where they've spoken about the pedigree of a certain racehorse or the pedigree of a dog so this is what they are referring to so when we look at a pedigree diagram it basically represents a family tree just with more detail because we are also looking at the phenotypes of the family as well as the genotypes that occurs within a family and very interesting is that this is largely used in the breeding of animals um, such as racehorses game like sable or black impala and then in the agricultural indus industry with the bulls or even um, the cows in the in the agricultural industry in South Africa you get dairy cows you get beef cows and all of this is based off of the yield so these farmers want to get a cow that has a large dairy yield per day so that they get the most out of the animal that they can as well as with beef so they want to get a lot of meat off of one carcass and there's actually catalogs you can I guess you can call them catalogs that you can look at to see um, what animal you are buying uh, usually how it works here is you would purchase the sperm of an animal and then inseminate the cows on your farm for example so looking at one of these catalogs um, it's quite interesting so this is for uh, beef Wagyu beef in particular those of you that know what Wagyu beef is or don't know it's a very um, expensive meat with uh, very nice so the fat is in between in between the muscle and it's not like on on the on the edge like in a choppy that you would eat for example so in these catalogs you can see um, the type of inoculations that the animals get the health program they follow so all the medicine that they are injected with you can see the fertility tests that are run on the bulls and then if you go down you can even see a picture of the bull whose sperm you might be purchasing um, you can see the pedigree diagram of that bull so who his parents are what offspring he has sired um, so there's lots of data involved with this and it's quite interesting so if you are interested in genetics this is a very good field because a lot of South African a large portion of the South African economy is agricultural so there is quite interesting work that can be done so that's just some some interesting facts for you so back to the work uh, let's look at one of these pedigree diagrams that you could expect in an e exam paper so obviously yours will just be in black and white but this is a pedigree diagram to show hemophilia in a family so hemophilia we know is a sex linked disor disorder so when we read sex linked we know that we have to work with females with the X chromosomes and then males with the XY chromosomes in this diagram what you'll see is males and females so males are represented generally with a square and then females with a circle at the bottom of the diagram they'll give you um, a, a key box for example where they tell you what represents what on the diagram so a normal female would be that color and then we know a normal female would have the following alleles um, because hemophilia uh, if you don't have so a normal person without hemophilia will be a capital H because it's the dominant trait and then somebody that has hemophilia will be represented by a lower case H okay now uh, a hemophiliac female so she will look like that and a carrier female she will have a normal phenotype but in a genotype 
she will have a recessive trait for hemophilia. Normal male, XY. Remember the X is the only chromosome that can carry these alleles, so a normal male would look like that. And then a hemophiliac male would look as follows. So let's, let's look at the parents of this diagram. So they are represented over here, and let's number them 1 and 2. And then they will produce these offspring. These are their offspring. And then this little thing is representing who they are married to. Okay, so we can directly see that this pedigree diagram, these are the parents and then obviously their offspring. And then it shows who their offspring got married to and then their children. So this one goes a bit further. So these were the children of the F1 generation. So these would then be the F2 generation children. That child then got married, produces, produced an F3 generation as well. So um, it's, it's like a mind map, so just follow it. So let's look at these parents. This one would have been a carrier female. So her genetic makeup would have looked like this. And then she was crossed with a normal male who would have looked like that. So doing just a quick genetic cross, not doing a proper one with P1 and all of that. Let's uh, do a Punnett square and see what can be expected. So this would have been for the female. And then this, oops, that for the male. So crossing them, this is what you would have had. Okay, so the probability of the fee of, of the children, what what traits could they have inherited? Uh, so they could produce a female that is um, homozygous normal, or they could have produced a female that is normal but heterozygous because she is a carrier of the hemophilia trait or allele. Then they could have produced a normal, let me just a normal male and then they could have produced a male that is a carrier um, of this trait so he would be a hemophiliac male so that is what you would look at and if we look at um, what the offspring looked like they basically had a bit of everything so there was a hemophiliac male there was a normal male there was a normal female and then a carrier female, but no recessive female was produced, so no he, uh, hemophiliac female uh, because of those dominant chromosomes that would just overshadow anything, um, and then obviously because it was a male as well. Okay, let's look at some questions from previous exam papers. So mice have white fur, or black fur. Mice may have white fur or black fur, excuse me. The diagram shows the inheritance of fur color in mice. So once again, a female that is a clear white circle will have white fur. A male with white fur will be, will be represented with a clear white circle, a square, and then a female that has black fur will be represented by a dark circle and the male with a dark square. Now already from this diagram, I can already determine what is my dominant traits just by the sheer amount of them on the diagram because there are more of them that are produced. So having black fur in this case would be the dominant trait. And I can say this just by looking at uh, parents one and two. They produce offspring that are majority black and then one that is white. If this was the recessive gene, then they would not be a different color produced, if you understand what I'm saying. So looking at it like, uh, let's just see, I think they give us what the alleles, okay, so a dominant allele is A and a recessive is a lowercase a. So let's use that and let's quickly just play around a bit and see why black is the dominant. 
So let's say they were recessive. So you had that crossing with that because both parents would have had to be recessive because they're both black. So in the end, if you are drawing a Punnett square, all of the offspring would have been recessive. And we know that is not the case because there's one offspring that looks different from the others. So if we now go and look at the possibilities, let's say one of the parents is dominant for black, homozygous dominant, and one of the parents is heterozygous because we still want to get that white fur produced. Let's look if that is possible using these alleles in the Punnett square. So there would be a homozygous black, homozygous black, heterozygous black. Have we produced a different color? No. So the parents definitely don't look like that. Let me just make clear my screen there so we can do some more work. Okay. So I can already determine that one of the parents, in fact both of the parents, will be heterozygous dominant. And the reason for that is we need one to produce a different color. So crossing these, the chances of one, there's one offspring or there is an offspring could be uh, homozygous black, heterozygous, heterozygous, and then one homozygous recessive. So that makes sense because um, black color will come through here, here, and here, and then there will be a white. So I can already say that parent one and parent two were heterozygous dominant. Okay. So what is this type of diagram called? It is called a pedigree diagram. How many sets of parents are represented in this diagram? So there's one set over there, there's another set over there, and then there's one more set of parents over there, so there are three parents. Give the phenotype, so which is dominant. So the dominant phenotype would be black, and then if the recessive, if they asked for that, that would have been white. What is the phenotype of individual number nine. So let's look. Let's quickly, just for interest sake, run a test here, a test cross. So the father was homozygous recessive and then the mom would most likely be also, um, she would be heterozygous. Now let's see why I'm saying that. Let's draw our Punnett square. So that one would be heterozygous, heterozygous, then recessive, two recessives. So two homozygous recessive, and that is what you also see in this diagram. So number nine, uh, the phenotype would most definitely look like that. Use the letter A for the dominant allele and A for the recessive allele to give the genotype of eight. So 8 would be that because it is the recessive one. And then number 16, I would also say, um, would be heterozygous uh, because there's a parent uh, that is homozygous recessive. So it would look like that. Let's look at two more of these pedigree diagrams. Uh, the reason I'm looking at these uh, two is specifically because they show different types of dominance. So the diagram below shows the inheritance of coat color in pigs through three generations. Now if we look at um, the coat color here, we see red, pink, and white. Now what kind of dominance is this? This is incomplete dominance. Why? Because the, there is a new trait that is formed. When this one mixes 
with this one, we've got a new trait, think, that is formed. So neither of the parent phenotypes are dominant over the other, um, and thus a new trait is formed. Another place where we saw this was in snapdragons, so in flowers, uh, you would also see this. So that is incomplete dominance. This one on the other side, um, on the other hand, the pedigree diagram shows inheritance of flower color in, cer in a certain type of plant over three generations. So there was a white flower and a red flower that was crossed, and then they produced a flower with equal di distribution of white and red color. So you're going to basically have a flower that looks something like this if represented. So what kind of dominance is this? This is co-dominance um, because both uh, traits are equally dominant. So both alleles are equally dominant and both show up in the phenotype. I hope that helped you and that is the end of this video. Thank you.